this year we have been fortunate to have Mr. Lucio Bussetti with us for the year. Uh, and it has been a great pleasure. And you have, if you have not met him yet, I mean, he's still here until early May. Uh, so Mr. Bussetti is a lawyer by training and he's a principal legal advisor for the Commission on Foreign and Security Policy and External Relations at the European Union. Um, his main area is um, uh, international law. Um, and he has um, um, uh, worked on uh, issues uh, concerning the relationship between the European Union uh, as an independent actor in the international sphere. He has represented the European Union in court cases before the European Court of Justice and before the WTO. Um, and he's this year with us working on uh, questions of U European foreign policy, right, and sort of at the challenges uh, um, and he's developing, a, as I understand, sort of in my conversations with him, a sort of a think paper, a policy paper that he seeks to present uh, to the sort of president of the commission uh, upon his return. So we are very much looking forward to his um, intervention. Um, and um, the, the second, the, the other participant uh, in today's event is Professor Arne Vestad, uh, who is a scholar of uh, global history um, at here at Yale. Uh, okay, so I don't need to uh, spend much time to introduce <laughs> Professor Vestad, who has uh, who's an expert in the history of the Cold War, China-Russia relations, uh, uh, and more recently he's working on, um, um, as I understand it, uh, the sort of right, the, the political origin of economic reforms mm -hmm. in China. Uh, and, uh, as I understand it, uh, Mr. Uh, Lucio Gossetti will just will talk for about 15 minutes, um, and then we will move uh, to uh, uh, sort of to uh, some comments by Professor Vesta, and then sort yes. of Q&A period, which Professor Vesta, I hope, will moderate. Okay. All right, so thanks so much. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, uh, two lines that are necessary at the beginning of all events of this kind. My sincere thanks to Professor Mares and to all my colleagues that have helped me through these days to prepare this, and obviously to Arne Bestet for being together with me today. The second is a, an obligatory thing that I need to do every time, uh, the disclaimer, whatever I say, don't blame the European Commission. It's only my thoughts <laughs> and nothing else than my thoughts. So um, just following up with the presentation that Professor Mares just made, what I'm actually doing here in this uh, beautiful, extraordinary university is trying to help the European Union institutions to reflect on the creation of the European Common Defense. Um, just to give a very brief uh, one minute description of my paper. Uh, basically, the creation of the European Common Defense uh, is supposed to be a major step of the integration of the European Union member states. And there are people in the logic which has been that the one since the beginning or of an ever closer union among people of the, of the European continent. And in my paper, I try to explain that this may have effects that are comparable to the creation of the Council of Europe and the Court of Human Rights or the creation of the internal market or the, or the creation of the appearance of the single currency, the euro. So we are talking about an event that when it comes about, it will be significant for the entire planet. While I was inquiring and my paper, unfortunately, is becoming uh, too big to handle. Um, and I was inquiring on the objectives of the EU common defense. I had to overcome a significant number and I am over trying to overcome a significant number of difficulties related to a, the relative silence of the treaties on what are exactly the aims and purposes of the, of the European Common Defense, which hides, in my view, a certain contrast and debate which has never faded away in these old years. And I did what the lawyers do. Instead of relying on words, I relied on the context. And in the context, I came across the logic, uh, the, the point which is the notion, which is a complex notion of promotion and preservation of peace. If, uh, if you could put on the first slide, please. So this is article 21 of the Treaty on European Union. 
And as you can see, one of the objectives of the European Union is to preserve peace, prevent conflicts, and strengthen international security in accordance with the purposes and principles of the United Nations Charter, with the principles of the Helsinki Final Act, and here we come to the subject matter of our discussions, and with the aims of the Charter of Paris, second element, including those relating to the external borders. Uh, these complex notions that I will not uh, enter into too much into too much of the detail at this stage because otherwise it will, I will be speaking for 40 minutes, not 20. Um, basically contains three elements, as you can see. Preservation of, pe of peace, which means protection from outside interference and attack. The second is conflict prevention, active engagement for peace. And third, strengthening of international security, meaning a multilateral action of shared for a shared peace. Now, in trying to understand what that means, I went through the history of, the, of this wording. This language is basically a copy-paste of the Treaty on European Union of 1993 which was negotiated and concluded in Maastricht, the Netherlands. And this text has remained absolutely unchanged, save this, this last bit, including those related to the external border. This has been added in Lisbon. Otherwise, the rest is identical. <coughs> it comes from Maastricht. It has been confirmed in Amsterdam in 1999. It has continued through the Nice Treaty and now Lisbon Treaty. So uh, if you can show the second slide, the history is interesting. I uncovered, the, this is the original text, uh, is in French, but the translation, believe me, for those who do not read French, is absolutely identical to the text in English you have just seen. So this is the original <coughs> document of the European Commission of uh, February 1991, which was proposed to the negotiator at the time of the Maastricht Treaty upon a mandate of the European Council of the leaders of the European, at that time, the European communities in Rome in 1990. So the leaders gave the mandate to the European Commission to prepare a master plan for the negotiations. And here comes, you see, reinforced security of Europe and maintenance of peace in the world in conformity with the United Charters, United Nations Charter. No mentioning of Helsinki, no mentioning of the Charter of Paris. <clears throat> please, the next one. This is, yes, please. Before we go to the next one, there's mention of NATO, which is very important. Yeah, I really want to refer to that because. At the end here, it's, it's, it refers to NATO alliance. Alliance. This, uh, this is also this is also what happens throughout. But my focus today is Helsinki. So the second. Uh, so please. So this is October 1991. What happens in the middle? One is formal and one is substantive. Formally, somebody. I assume because I could not find a definite response to that. Uh, somebody, probably the presidency at the time that was chairing the negotiating session, inserted, proposed this text that now contains <laughs> the reference to Helsinki and the reference to the Charter of Paris. So something happened in between and willingly, deliberately, the negotiators decided to insert this. And that text became the Treaty of Maastricht, signed in February 1992, and then entered into force in July 1993. And from then on, it continued. When I say from then on it continued, we must be clear, it was ratified four times by parliaments of all the member states of the European Union. Can you please move on to the next? This is what happened in between, in between. And in my view, this is particularly uh, telling. So at the moment, the Maastricht negotiators insert 
this reference to Helsinki and the Charter of Paris, look at what is starting. What I didn't mention earlier, and I say now, in August, there was the coup against Gorbachev. Not yet the solution of the Soviet Union. It happened the 31st of December of that year, but still the situation was extremely unstable. So my point, the point I wanted to make here is that it was in a context of heightened uncertainty, concrete danger and geopolitical volatility <clears throat> that there was a willful decision by the member states of the time of the European communities, now European Union, to link their future and their external relations to the Helsinki principles of the Charter of Paris. And, and what is this? I mean, I will, I will come to describing this in a moment. But basically the logic followed at the time was, we are in danger, collective danger. We need more cooperation, more transparency, more trust building, more military predictability. That was the logic that underpinned that decision. Interestingly, this, as I said already before, this remain, has remained unaltered until now. Look what happened later. I mean, if I refer only to this country where we are, we are located now, uh, these references went through the 9-11 attacks, the Gulf Wars, and the collapse of the Lehman Brothers Bank. Major uncertainties, major upheavals, and still that anchor politically. So what is Helsinki? Uh, I, I, I was struggling with the idea of trying to summarize something that has taken 50 years to build. So I, I decided that the best would be to extract uh, the description that the US Helsinki Commission, which is, I, mean, I happen to have understood now, is a US government commission that promotes human rights, military security, and economic cooperation in Europe. And is actually chaired by the representative Joe Wilson, a Republican of South Carolina. So uh, I, I read it out because, in my view, it's an excellent summary. They, this website of the US Commission, Helsinki Commission, says that on August 19, 1975, the leaders of the original 35 participating states gathered in Helsinki. And my God. Sorry for that. I don't know. Anyway, whatever. Uh, <laughs> Gathering Helsinki can sign the final act of the conference, also known as the Helsinki Accords. The final act is a comprehensive act containing a broad range of measures designed to enhance security and cooperation in the region, extending from Vancouver to Vladivostok. It is the so-called Euro-Atlantic space. It contains three baskets. Basket one is the security dimension. I will revert to that in a minute. The, sec the second one is the economic dimension. And the third one is the human dimension, meaning the human rights. Since 1975, the number of countries signing the Helsinki Accords has expanded to 57, reflecting changes such as the breakup of <laughs> Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. The conference uh, has been institutionalized and now is an organization, organization of security and cooperation in Europe that has a seat in Vienna. And its works continue, although the difficulties are plain to be seen uh, given the present circumstances. The Helsinki Final Act contained a declaration on principles guiding relations between participating states. And these are the 10 principles. Most of them you recognize are derived from the UN Charter. But actually the list covers long descriptions of each of them, which I have reproduced for easy of presentation. And those uh, long explanations go in deep into what is expected by each and every participant. 
And when I say participant, let's not forget, as I, I mentioned a minute ago, the United States were always on this since the beginning. We are always part of this and are still part of this. This was premised already in Helsinki by the concept of indivisibility of security. So one of the premises of the chart of the final act says recognizing the divisibility of security in Europe, as well as their common interest in the development of cooperation throughout Europe and among selves and expressing their intention to pursue efforts accordingly. This is the original text of the Helsinki final act, which was reinforced by the Charter of Paris that added a significant sentence, security is indivisible, and the security of every participant state is inseparably linked to that of all the others. So this linkage was added by Paris. So when the negotiators of the Maastricht Treaty refer to Helsinki and Paris, wanted exactly to underline this in particular, among other things, but this was major, was very important for the collective security. Now, if we move on to the next slide, then now we see what is the present description, which I have already anticipated together with Arne in our uh, advertisement for this event. So the concept was uh, continued to evolve in 1999 in the conference in Istanbul. And then finally, it achieved its final um, uh, si mm, mm, uh, stable uh, description in Astana, Kazakhstan. Uh, this is the final text as it, it, I have reproduced it from the official document of the 3rd December 2010, although uh, formally uh, the, the, the declaration was adopted the day before the 2nd the second of December, but I couldn't find any document uh, of the second. So I refer to the third as my uh, uh, as the original text. So you see, uh, the first sentence refers is the sentence of the Charter of Paris. The second, which I haven't, the third sentence, which I haven't highlighted, is very interesting for what I will be saying in a minute on the Ukraine. Uh, Russia war, we reaffirm the inherent right of each and every participant state to be free to choose or change its security arrangements. But then the third sentence, which I highlighted for also obvious reasons that will come in a minute, they will not strengthen their security at the expense of the security of other states. That last sentence is apparently the pretext, I'm using purposely the word, the pretext that the Russian authorities are using in order to blame the West for having violated the Helsinki uh, final act. Uh, again, I am trying to remain as neutral as I can here and as factual based as possible. So this is why I'm pointing at you uh, what I suspect is their hook or the hook of the Russian side uh, uh, to, to blame the West in their narrative. Um, now, uh, I will move now to the, to the Ukraine-Russia war. In the months preceding the aggression of Ukraine by the Russian Federation, which, uh, as everybody knows, unfortunately started the 24th of February 2022, there were an, a significant number of uh, contacts between the Russian Federation, NATO, and the United States that took place at the highest diplomatic and governmental level. In all these exchanges, I mean all of them, the parties refer directly or indirectly to the Helsinki notion of indivisibility of security. Uh, this all started with the Russian authorities sending the US and NATO on 17th of December, 2021, a draft treaty called Treaty Between, I, have, I, 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 I checked on the Russian website, the, the, tech, the, the title that they gave it, the official title, and it is Treaty Between the US and Russia on Security Guarantees. This is the title that the Russian authorities have given to this draft text. So 
the Russian authorities on 17th of December 2021 sent to NATO and the United States this draft treaty whose Article 1 states, the parties shall cooperate on the basis of principles of indivisible, equal, and undiminished security. The echo of Helsinki is clear. Now, this is the response from NATO on 26th of January 2022, where, I mean, uh, this is taken from a website which I found uh, in, in the Texas University that had incorporated uh, documents, confidential documents that had been copied by the newspaper El País. Imagine, this is how I retrieve this. Otherwise, apparently this is still confidential. I don't know what confidential that is, but in any event, I retrieved it from there. So, um, I'm not gonna read all this, simply quote a couple of passages. NATO says, remains firmly committed to fundamental principles and agreements underpinning European security. Again, in direct reference to Helsinki and Astana. For more than 30 years, NATO has worked to build a partnership with Russia. No other partner has offered a comparable relationship on a similar institutional framework. More, NATO response explicitly refers to the Euro-Atlantic security. It's exactly the concept of, of security from Vancouver to Vladivostok. The whole logic of the Helsinki process. The next one is more explicit. This is the same date that it, the, the last paragraph, the response of the United States. And this is really explicit. The United States supports efforts to improve the security of the Euro Atlantic area. Here again, and believes the dialogue on matters of concern has the potential to produce meaningful outcomes. Such dialogue must take place within the appropriate formats including OSCE, meaning the Helsinki format, and must uphold the foundational principles of the European security embodied in foundational documents, such as the Helsinki final act. So here we go, the 26th of January, 2022, the United States were forcefully, repeatedly referring to that framework. Please. Next one. And here comes the answer by Foreign Minister Lavrov, sent to the US uh, Secretary of State Blinken, to other foreign minister of the European States, and to the Canadian Foreign Minister. And here again, US and NATO re response to our proposal received on 26th of January demonstrate serious differences in the understanding of the principle of equal and indivisible security that is fundamental to the entire European security architecture. We believe it is necessary to immediately clarify this issue and as it will determine the prospects for future dialogue. And later, Mr. Lavrov says, the principle of indivisible security is selectively interpreted as a justification for the ongoing course towards a responsible expansion of NATO. This is the official, an official translation that I took out from the website of the, of the uh, Ministry of Foreign, uh, of Foreign Affairs of Russia. So uh, again, take it as the official position of the Russian government. Now, in his speech of yesterday, I have to adapt my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Putin, the president of the Russian Federation, has used exactly identical or similar language. Here I quote, again, I took this from the Kremlin, uh, from the side of the Kremlin. So I'm quoting their translation of, of Mr. Putin's words. We were open, sincerely ready for a constructive dialogue with the West. We said and insisted that both Europe and the whole world needed, once again, an indivisible security system equal for all countries. And for many years, we suggested that our partners discuss this idea together and work for, on its implementation. But in response, we received either an indistinct or hypocritical reaction 
but there were also actions. NATO's expansion to our borders, the creation of new deployment of areas of missile defense, deployment of military contingents, not just near Russia's border. These are Mr. Putin's words. So now comes a few considerations of mine after this presentation of the text and the, and the, and the documents. Today is just two, two days before the first year anniversary of the illegal aggression of Ukraine by the Russian Federation. Let me say, first of all, that there is absolutely nothing in the Helsinki Final Act or in its evolutions in Paris or Astana or in the UN Charter that may condone or absolve or even slightly diminish the responsibilities of the Russian Federation. Okay. This, what we heard in the words, uh, are in my personal view, manipulative attempts to twist the sense of close to 50 years of debates. This is my appreciation of what I hear from the Russian side. And yet, no matter how one imagines the end of this terrible war, starting with the most favorable scenario, a victorious Ukraine, the need of a stable European continent for an indivisibility security from protecting all of us from Vancouver to Vladivostok, in my view, remains essential. I mean to say three things here. Morally, we should refuse the logic of returning to the 1950s and to another Cold War, because a Cold War means side conflicts by proxy and an incredible amount of pain and waste of money. And that is simply unacceptable morally, at least for me. Legally, as I am a lawyer of the European Union, this, what I showed, is part of the Union, European Union Treaty. So we are bound to interpret our own actions in light of the, of the principles of Helsinki. We are not free to go outside that unless the old circumstances is changed to the point that we cannot follow them anymore. And I would overstep slightly Arnold's <laughs> area by also referring historically to a responsibility that we have, meaning the generations that have made the Berlin Wall collapse cannot simply rebuild it a few hundred miles east, identical. I mean, it would be a clear defeat of this generation. The end game contained in the logic of, end of Helsinki is that there is no end game. Astana says it, said it, I, I showed the, 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 the text. The states of the Euro-Atlantic space will not strengthen their security at the expense of the security of the other states. Russia at present is attempting to do just the opposite of that. It's reinforcing its security at the expense of Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia. And they are all signatories of the Astana Declaration. Let me also point to another element of manipulation here. By proposing a dialogue only with NATO and the United States, Russia is actually denying Ukraine's statehood, as it does constantly with Moldova and Georgia and self-attributing a status of big power, supposedly more important than the lesser one, such as the Ukraine. This is the thinking behind. Again, there is no argument that one can, can find in the Helsinki agreements to justify uh, what the Russian is doing. Preparing the aftermath of the war requires all of us to assume a shared starting point that has the potential to include all in a shared vision of a peaceful future. And by saying that, I have to underline once again that everybody, all the actors of this terrible thing that is the war that is ongoing, while blaming the others, continue to make all their arguments revolve around the Helsinki final act logic. This is a fact. 
So in my research and today, my contention is that notwithstanding and beyond the wavering of the political debate, and despite the horror of the crimes that Russian troops are committing and that must be prosecuted, we should collectively return or at least strive to return to the logic that has been pursued for almost 50 years. Some final considerations from my side and I'll pass the floor to you. Stealing away from rhetoric and partnership is my attempt. I hope I, I can do it. It is a fact for me that as we meet here today, there, is, there are a significant number of uncertainties and incognite that do not, do not allow at present, at least do not allow me to formulate with a sufficient degree of likelihood a possible outcome of this war. Let me mention some of them. The structure of the present pinnacle of the Russian regime and the personalities that compose it. This is a major uncertainty. The lack of visibility on what may constitute a sufficient guarantee for the long-term security of Ukraine and Georgia and Moldova, and what may or may not be the role of NATO. The perception on both sides, this is very worrying to me, as to how the future scenarios may play out, including opposing optimism on which side may profit more from a prolongation of war. You heard it from Mr. Putin yesterday, once again. The asymmetric escalation on both sides that does not allow, or at least doesn't allow me, to draw firm conclusions on what may or may not constitute a niche for winning the war. And finally, although it is really latest but not last, the risk of nuclear implications by design or simply by stupid accident. More fundamentally, there is a significant uncertainty as to winning means, what winning means on both sides of the front. Even the total recovery by Ukraine of the totality of international recognized territory does not mean per se neither peace nor stability, and let alone long-term stability. But this is not the real point of my presentation today. Whenever the moment comes, this is my point. And it will come. The EU and the US should be united in presenting a credible offer to Russia that gives a perspective of stability of peace for the whole continent and for the Euro Atlantic space. Why that? Not only for the reasons that I have already described until now, but because that perspective should be able to avert two very dangerous developments. The spillover from other areas of geographical instability into the European continent, Middle East and Far East, and worryingly even more, that China becomes a determining actor of the European stability. So my suggestion here, and I will conclude, uh, Arne, and pass the floor to you, is that the logic of Helsinki is the most secure way of approaching the matter at hand. I have great doubts that we, have, that we will find soon enough and efficiently enough a broad consensus to engage on alternative paths. And we should not make the mistake of conflating the long-term strategy, which is the indivisibility of security, with the other issue, which is rebuilding trust on both sides of the present conflict. Because trust must be rebuilt in any event if we want to achieve a sustain sustainable peace. And my thoughts, opinions, go in the sense that offering reciprocal guarantees within a known scenario meaning the Helsinki Paris Astana framework in full respect with the Union Charter is likely to be the most direct and efficient way to reach it, hopefully sooner rather than later and put an end to this terrible conflict. Thank you very much, Richard. It's really, truly fascinating and opens up for all kinds of, of discussions um, for me, mainly about whether what we will do if we are give, given a second chance after the 1990s of 
reconstructing an inclusive European security uh, framework. So I'm going to uh, have most of my comments on this, but let me say just before beginning that it's fascinating to discuss this issue with, with Lucio because of the variety of experiences that he has had as a top EU official. So law, of course, is a very significant part of it, but it's not in terms of international affairs, your background as a lawyer that is most significant. It's your position as a key advisor on international affairs to the Commission. And um, in a situation that has gone, in many ways, from an all-European perspective, from bad to worse, I'm, I'm really glad to know that there is someone like you advising the Commission on these kinds of issues, not just the legal implications, but the whole framework that you laid out today, and which I'm sure you're going to continue working on when you return to Europe. So my view on this overall is that we failed in many ways in the 1990s in creating a uniform and comprehensive framework for European security. Um, and when I say we, I mean everyone who were involved in the, in the post-Cold War settlement, or what should have been a, a comprehensive uh, Cold War settlement. Because we didn't make use of the opportunities that obviously existed at that point to create security institutions and agreements that went much further than what had been proposed under the OCSE framework prior to the end of the Cold War. What we did instead was that we retreated in many ways to that, to that framework instead of trying to build on it later on. And many of us were saying in the 1990s that there would be a comeuppance for that because at some point, uh, particularly with regard to Russia, but also in a, in a much bigger global context, some of the security issues that we were dealing with at the end of the Cold War would come back. They wouldn't come back in the same form as they had during the Cold War, as some of you have seen from stuff that I published. I'm profoundly skeptical of thinking that the same kind of logic applies today as applied during the Cold War. But with many of the same actors involved, and particularly with regard to Russia, uh, because what we did was to leave Russia as a kind of uh, dissatisfied scavenger on the outside of the European system. Um, now, this is in no way absorbing the Russians from the responsibility, as, as Lucio has said as well, uh, for their aggression, not just against Ukraine repeatedly, but also, also against other countries. But it is explaining, I think, what we didn't get right and what we could, if opportunity comes up, um, try to do try to do better. So I'm wondering, and this, this will be speculative on my side, but I've been thinking a lot about this over the last few weeks. If we try to push those sets of issues from a European perspective, first and foremost, more than from a US perspective, what would be the direction to go in? And I think Lucio pushed many of those buttons in your, in your talk that we will need to consider, even in a very broad framework. So one of the most significant, of course, that we really got wrong in the 1990s was that Europe withdrew back under what had been the NATO umbrella and didn't really care very much about its own security organization. Right? Um, it might seem harsh for me to say that because the zeitgeist, of course, at the time was that this great conflict was over and the, the need for security, not, not least, but not exclusively in, in military terms, uh, was diminished or, you know, was no longer was no longer around. And with the United States, mainly through NATO institutions offering that kind of security uh, for the EU countries and for other countries in Europe that were associated with EU at that point, there was really a need to push much further for Europe to take its own security needs and its own security position seriously. And I think that was part of the problem back in the 1990s. I think many of the failures that we had with the post-Cold War settlement were European failures, more than, more than American failures. Moving much more quickly towards European common defense, as you mentioned, uh, setting up uh, institutions, organizations, and not least, not least spending uh, and recruitment that would at least over time, over a generation, which was what was talked about at that point, uh, allow Europe to be much less, still in alliance with, but much less dependent on the United States for its own continental defense. Um, that didn't happen. 
and it opened up for the kind of you know much more complicated situation that we have now. So one of the things that I am really hoping for is that when this war ends, and end it will, and I'll talk more about that in a second, um, that this is perhaps the main European conclusion that is drawn from it. Um, that even though the United States and Europe have worked fantastically well together on most issues in, in supporting and resupplying Ukraine during the war, the long-term idea that Europe would be dependent on the United States for its defense has to go, particularly because US uh, interests with regard to global international affairs are turning very fast towards Eastern Asia. Uh, Someone was asking me yesterday, will that necessarily be at Europe's expense? My answer to that is yes, <laughs> because if you look at this country now, there is absolutely no appetite for taking on several of these uh, security commitments above what already exists uh, at the same time. And the focus is going to be relentlessly on Eastern Asia because of, because of China's rise. So, so taking responsibility for European defense should be a starting point for then thinking about what do we do with Russia when this, when this war has ended, when Russia has lost the war, because Russia is going to lose the war. I'm not entirely certain whether Ukraine is going to win the war, but I think Russia is going to lose the war. And, and we already see the framework for that. We can talk more about that in, in, in the Q&A. But it's, it's lost it mainly because it is not capable of achieving the aims that President Putin had put forward when he launched an all-out attack on Ukraine. It's not, never going to go back to that uh, in terms of the objective of wiping out the Ukrainian state. It's not going to happen. So in that sense, Russia has lost. The problem is then, of course, how do we get from the current state of peace over onto something that I would like to call a victory for Ukraine? And that's where these larger structural issues meet the issues on the ground in Ukraine. Yes. What would a Ukrainian victory consist of? I think driving the Russians, Russian forces with American and European help further back this spring, which I think probably will happen. I'm not 100% certain about it, but I think the chances are pretty good for that will happen. Followed by a ceasefire with the rapid integration of Ukraine into the EU. That's a Ukrainian victory. It's a massive Ukrainian victory. Right? It doesn't entail giving up the, the uh, parts of Ukraine that have been illegally occupied by Russia. But it means, as Steve Kotkin put it in, in this quite very Kotkin-esque interview with David Remnick in, in, in the New Yorker, that Putin's active destruction of Ukraine and everything Ukrainian will be brought to a stop at the same time as Europe takes over the responsibility of rebuilding Ukraine and making it into an associated and integrated European state. That, to me, is a Ukrainian victory. Now, will the military activities at the borders necessarily stop at that? I doubt it. Uh, will, will there be other attempts from the Russian side at breaking that peace? Probably, at least in the shorter run. But this would still constitute to me a Ukrainian victory. Also went to your final point, Lucio, because it shows Russia that in a way, given the European cohesion that they, that Putin has solidified beyond anything that existed before on these kinds of issues, there are also uh, an interest in acting in, in, in taking responsibility for the inclusion of Ukraine. Um, and I think, uh, is this likely? I mean, that, maybe I should end with that and then we could take questions. Uh, is, is this scenario likely? I think it depends very much on whether the EU and the EU institutions recognize that this is the time to really stand up, both to the principles that, that, that you discussed, um, but also showing the capacity that most member states of the EU have shown uh, for actually engaging in defensive war uh, during during the, the conflict in, in Ukraine. So I'm I'm optimistic about it. It would it would entail a gigantic leap for a, a union that is uh, 
increasingly adverse to making these kinds of leaps, or at least has been in, in a structural sense, which you might not, might not agree with that. But it is absolutely necessary, because if the war ends without that kind of European commitment to Ukraine, then there is no way in which Ukraine can win the war. And, and much of the European and American effort to support Ukraine would have been lost if Ukraine is left behind without an opening, without that open access and integration into Europe. Um, some people are then saying, well, aren't we then just perpetuating, you know, the security difficulties that were there back in the 1990s, with I mean, all sort of moving the Berlin Wall, you know, uh, 700 miles further east? I don't think so, because there will also be a clear reminder in this constant reminder of Russia um, that by self-excluding from the kind of structures that so many Russians in their heart of hearts aspire to be part of, right? um, then the responsibility is for the, is on them to continue that kind of situation without an immediate uh, possibility for gain. Right? That's pretty powerful. Uh, and would have been pretty powerful, I think, in any kind of setting. Now, Putin might, you know, as long as Putin is in power, this might be impossible. He might not be willing or able to think in terms of those kinds of solutions. But I know quite a few Russians who would, um, after Russia has lost the war on the ground. So that's what I had to say on, on this today. And I'd be happy to take questions. Try to direct your questions to Lucio first, and then I'd be happy to chime in. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Lucio, thank you for that presentation. <clears throat> The um, Astana Declaration, you pointed to uh, a central ambiguity, which is the Russians focus on the last sentence, which says uh, one state shall not increase its security at the expense of another. On the other hand, in the middle, it says uh, you shall have the freedom to choose, choose your alliances. But in a colonial empire framework in which Putin thinks if the Ukrainians change their alliance, it automatically threatens the security, yes. which raises the question now. Um, before this began, uh, Zelensky put on the table his willingness to negotiate about neutrality going forward. But at this point in the conflict, having expended so much, um, they've upped the ante to request joining the uh, NATO and join the EU as the critical features of, of their future. And a question I have for you is, what is your prediction? Uh, can the Ukrainians uh, get to a ceasefire, get to a peace agreement, and uh, nevertheless stay outside of these security arrangements as a way of appeasing Putin's desire to uh, claim that um, the middle sentence has not undone the last sentence? Well, you are you oblige me to make a link with what Arne uh, has just said. And uh, unfortunately, starting by disagreeing with him on one tiny detail. And the disagreement is about the involvement of the United States. Let me take you through the logic I see. The logic is the following. Ukraine should become a member of the European Union without any doubt as soon as possible. What that means depends on political and administrative circumstances, but this is the, the track. The track requires, therefore, that Ukraine joins a bloc that has also in its cards for a long time, the creation of a common defense. Arne rightly said that should have already have happened and didn't. The reasons why it didn't happen are multiple, and we cannot discuss them here, I'm sure. But one element is clear in my mind, that the next step of this logical line requires accommodation within NATO of the existence of a European common defense. So it requires the US to be part of that deal. And that shows, by the way, my book today is really terrible. These are all adverts on my phone, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to buy it. Um, that requires the United States to accommodate that. Accommodate means in positive terms, not in negative terms. It means that it requires a dialogue on that. That dialogue must produce, therefore, a situation whereby it is possible to 
formalize a change of the previous situation from the colonial thinking of the Russians into a free link within the European Union without necessarily having the result of Ukraine being part of NATO. That is the logical thinking. Now, that logical thinking requires an investment, a political investment that I am afraid to say I don't see yet. And this is a, something that I have discovered by working on this that is reproduced in my still draft paper that will be uh, concluded hopefully beginning of April. And, and I sense this sense of urgency also determined by the situation in Ukraine. And I was astonished to see that that sense of urgency has not yet you know, emerged uh, in the political sphere. Uh, I hear, as you have heard, many, many speeches from a lot of people on our side talking about you know, the great alliance, what we're doing so well. You know, we take propaganda apart as we need to do among friends and, and people trying to think. If you take the propaganda apart, the unanswered question is the one that Arne referred to. This necessity of a European common defense is not there yet. And the necessity to start thinking together with the American ally, how to do that? Because this is the key to solve the issue for Ukraine. The last word in response to you, I must mention once again, Moldova and Georgia. Because if I try to, <laughs> God forgive me for doing that, if I try to put myself into Putin's shoes, if I have a ceasefire on Ukraine, the first thing I would do, I would try to, to take uh, Blizi the same day. This is what I would think to do immediately. So we have to think Ukraine is the issue here, but it takes together always Georgia and Moldova. Otherwise, we are simply, you know, perpetuating the problem further down the road. Yes. Yeah, so I, I'm skeptical about the European defense policy. I come from Eastern Europe, uh, I'm from Romania. Okay, I just, uh, who is the driver of this policy? I mean, what we're learning in this war is just about divisions. We're learning about divisions within Germany. We're learning about the East-West divisions. We're learning, okay, where, so what is this and how do you see this happening politically, right? I mean, sort of, right, who is sort of, right, the, who are the actors that are going to push this and how are you going to deal with it? countries like Austria and, you know, sort of right where Russians are right. sort of right running the show. So, um, okay, so sort of how do you deal in this kind of, in your sort of even the most likely scenario, okay, uh, how do you deal with the growing East-West conflict, the growing East-East conflict between the Northern and the Southern parts? Mm -hmm. And where do you see sort of, right, okay, where is sort of, is this the French driven project? And so, right, where do you see kind of, you know, this demand, okay, for this, this European defense to come from? And why not work with, with the NATO? I mean, I just want to push you because I know you sort of right, have interesting things to say. I mean, sort of right, which kind of, you know, why not work within kind of the common institutions? Uh, I, I hate to say that your questions are answered in close to 100 pages in my paper. <laughs> so I will be more than happy to try to convince you uh, of the opposite and take you out of your skepticism with the, the long examination that I do of these two matters. For example, this what I consider is a fake news or a fake problem, the, the four neutral countries of the European Union having creating a problem to creating a European common defense. This is absolutely not true. It is not true for many, for many reasons. First and above all, and here comes the lawyer once again, is because when one creates a European common defense, it is European Union the actor not the states behind it. The international responsibility is for the European Union, not for Austria or for Ireland. So, and the ways to build that, I examine in my paper, in a few pages, the requirements of the Austrian constitution uh, to a point that allows me to say, without entering into detail, that I don't see any problem at all in doing that. But, Going back to your own question, I am troubled by your question, not because you asked it, but because it shows how much there is an entrenched um, narrative that continues. And it, it started already with Mr. Rumsfeld, 
you may remember that person, uh, who talked about, you know, old Europe and new Europe. And I wonder what is profitable to whom in this fake and useless division among member states to share exactly the same principles and exactly the same values. And I have, have to draw the attention, we share also exactly the same kind of danger and military danger at present, which is very, very significantly clear, isn't it? Um, in my paper, uh, and then I will not go for, long, for a long time, in my paper, I quote, for a significant number of lines, an internal document uh, of the European Commission of 2017, where with no, you know, no sweetness, it is described how inefficient, how cumbersome, how appallingly expensive is the system of European defense at present. If NATO hasn't succeeded in solving this in 70 more years of its existence, is it likely that it will solve it in the next 10 when the Russians set our borders? I am skeptical. I am skeptical. I think we have to change the method here. We cannot allow on the European continent to have four types of tanks that are not interoperable. And this is under the umbrella of NATO since 1949. I mean, there is a lot of talk, but if we really explain to our citizens how much of our of their taxes are squandered in this way, I mean, they would kill us, and rightly so. So my, I am advocating here a more down-to-earth debate on what are, we can do better. And I think there is a, you know, <laughs> uh, in French, translating from French, uh, we have a moral way open in front of us to do better. That would be my... Yes, please. Over there, and then we go, we go over there. Yes. Uh, Lucia, thank you for the illuminating analysis. It's Stephen Wertheim. Uh, good to see you in person. Yeah, of course. Not over Zoom. Of course. Uh, so I'm you know, very much in sympathy, as you know, uh, with... Uh, the search for a, a framework for European security that avoids a return to the Cold War and also bolsters European defense such that uh, Europe's defense isn't dependent on the United States being there uh, in, in five, 10 years, or even the short term, uh, increasingly, I think. But I'm wondering why you specifically see the value in uh, rehabilitating the the principle of indivisible security, which seems to me part of what has gotten us to where we are, which has allowed the United States and NATO to uh, do things that trespassed on the Russian sense of what their core interests were uh, and um, you know, seems to just open up this space where each party can say that the other is violating it and has this right to, to act um, aggressively in, in, in response. Um, so it might it not be more productive while trying to find some way to integrate Russia into European security? And I don't know how, how to do that. Um, at the same time, to be a little bit more accepting of the fact that um, there is now a state of real hostility. That doesn't mean going back to the 1950s, but it is legitimate for each side, as it were, to take steps that you know, may pose a security problem for the other side. And we're not going to sort of demonize the other side and, and create this intersubjective harm in suggesting that it's you know, uncivilized and beyond the pale for a state to respond according to its national interest. Well, actually, thank, this really is helpful. Thank you, because this allows me to, to draw the attention of all of us on a certain number of uh, difficulties of perspective in this matter. Uh, first of all, why why is Helsinki helpful? First, well, because it has a concept, and that concept doesn't exist in alternative now. Another concept, as I said in the, in the end, 
starting a negotiation that would appease the situation, we may start that. Is it likely that we get it in time and sufficiently strong? I don't see that. While we have that already. So that is, if you want, a pragmatic response to your question. But let me go further because you are certainly not satisfied by my pragmatism. <laughs> it's not enough. The second, the second reason is because nobody can actually integrate Russia. It's impossible. For historical reasons, here I refer to Arne. Arne, you may agree or disagree with me, but it's impossible. It's a, such a huge country with such a hugely, terribly dangerous arsenal of nuclear weapons. And there, there's Weltanschauung. The way they see the world is through their eight time zones, no? I spoke to several Russian persons that have this mentality according to which we don't need anybody else. It's so big, why, why do? So integrating an actor, you, an, 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 an actor, a world actor of that kind is a huge challenge. And the question is, would that not basically destroy the system that we have created here? So the only way, that's my second uh, response to you, the only way is to try to find a common ground that allows Russia to reduce the level of aggressiveness. Which brings me to the third reason. And the third reason is that we need the United States into this, not only for military matters. I am not a military person. I, I frankly would be, I would make a huge mistake if I started speaking about that. But if I remain on a geostrategic element, um, the United States, not only because represent the same values as the European Union, mm. but also because they have the same, and alliance obviously, but because they have the same kind of interest geographically, they have an interest of having another point of reference, which is Europe. Europe is, look at that, Europe is rightly in the middle between the two sides. Or if you want, the US is the indirect contact with Russia in the Eastern side on the Pacific. So that element of stability helps the United States on the Western side, on the Pacific, while at the same time keeps the logic of protecting democracy, our values. Let's not forget that Helsinki was, basket three, also about human rights, a long, Part of that was about human rights. If you ask me, you didn't mention that. I, I want to add on your list of mistakes that the Europeans made. The last one, the latest one, because I'm not sure it's the last, was to kick Russia out of the Council of Europe. We should have suspended Russia and never kicked them out. That was a major mistake because it was another you know, push in the wrong direction of creating a separation between the two sides. We absolutely do not need to fuel anymore the idea that Russians have already, Russians, the present government, the present regime of Russia has to be separate, to be better, to be, mm. uh, you know, super powerful alone. You know, the logic of being alone, I mean, I am Italian. I, 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 I read what our dearest, uh, uh, Duce said many times, no, we are alone, my God. <laughs> you saw what happened later. No? So as an Italian, as a European, I, I am afraid of that kind of logic. And I would suggest that we try to create the opposite situation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, we have two questions from our online audience. And the first is about the role international law could uh, play during the ongoing, uh, ongoing war and in the post-war post future, which role could international criminal law play both within and for the crime of oppression outside of the International Criminal Court in the Hague? 
And the second question is from a real politic perspective. Do you think it is still possible to uphold the um, Helsinki Accords after the war in Ukraine? And can we still achieve these great ideals? Not small questions. <laughs> no, 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 easy, no, easily dismissed. <laughs> uh, let me start from the second because it is easier for me to, uh, to respond. Uh, the human brain functions in a way that always has as a major problem what is before us at present. Uh, uh, what is happening in Ukraine is terrible, and I said it, it's deep heart in, in, in me. But at the same time, I, I wonder how we are forgetting so many other terrible situations around the world at present. <coughs> Uh, this present Russian regime is responsible for terrible carnage in Syria, for example, in, in destroying Aleppo. I, would, I could continue. So what I'm trying to say is that if we reason in geostrategic terms only because we are under the emotions of the latest terrible thing that has happened, and we lose track of the, of the long-term strategy. Mm -hmm. So my answer is, these are not fantastic principles. They are actually have been signed, ratified several times, have been committed, committing everybody, including the United States and Russia, for such a long time that they refer to this. Even yesterday, Putin was referring to this. So this is concrete. And no matter how difficult it is, I, my, my personal position would be we have to fight for that. Now, turning to international law, that's another interesting avenue because I see several levels here. Level number one is international law underpins all relations with among st states. And international law is first and above all the United Nations Charter. And Russia is violating the United Nations Charter at, at this time. So this must stop. The second is no. Arne said it, and I can only concur and support him in saying that we have to build more out of Helsinki, not Helsinki as it was, as it could be now, mm -hmm. in creating maybe something more structured, more formal. And if we do that, second avenue where international law is required. And third and final, the criminal law. I, I have been involved in these debates. Let me say, frankly, I am, although I am full in favor in supporting the Ukraine uh, uh, investigators for um, the crimes that have been committed by the Russian, uh, um, by the Russian army, uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity, I am also a uh, supporter of the ICC, the International Criminal Court, to, to use its powers, and they have some through exactly the attribution of jurisdiction uh, by Ukraine to investigate those crimes. The issue of the crime of aggression is a much more complicated one. And I have discussed this with several colleagues, including at the, at the Yale's uh, School of Law a couple of weeks ago. Um, let me just say one sentence on that. I wonder in, what, in which way Trying to build something which is very difficult to construe uh, allows us to reach more easy, more easily peace and share peace. I, I still don't see that. That's a really interesting discussion that you could follow up on as well. Yes, gentlemen, at the back first. Is it okay if we take two questions together? Is that fine? Yeah, please. It, it, it appears that. Nothing that Russia has signed or nothing that Putin has said affects or constrains what he does if he has the power to do it. So doesn't that imply then that any part of the anything that Russia wants can only be protected if Russia sees that there will be overwhelming conventional force to stop it? And that would imply then that we can give up on Georgia, we can give up on Moldova, unless we choose to 
ally with them in something like NATO, and we have to have NATO in Ukraine. I don't see how Ukraine can be defended any other way. Let me one question here, please. This is a serious question. Uh, thank you. So my question is, there may be another, um, or one element of what you're trying to say, but you don't say it that explicitly, I think, is that if you would replace security of Europe, uh, the main actor there, if you would uh, replace NATO by a common European defense within the European Union, that, that would reduce the perceived military threat on Russia. Uh, and that in that sense, this could also be part of a settlement that you have a decent defense of, of uh, Europe, but not an overwhelming one in which necessarily NATO and the United States are the, the main actors. My question to you, uh, so if you would agree with this uh, statement, first of all, my question to you is in one of his first blogs on the war, I think it was Sam Green in London, said the main threat for Russia is not NATO, it's not militarily, it's economically. Yeah. It's about uh, Ukraine becoming part of the European Union or associating, and it would be such a shock to the economic system in terms of reform and market reform that so much of the agricultural resources and other resources that are present in Ukraine would be drawn away from Moscow and redistribution within the system of oligarchs or whatever, and would come uh, basically within Europe, the West, and that this is the main threat. So taking into account the economic element, would you think that uh, replacing NATO by a common European defense, that this would assuage certain, uh, to a certain extent, the uh, uh, concerns of Mr. Putin, the Russian establishment, and Russia as a country? I think well, you have a chance to come keen on your position. I, I, yeah. I, I think I have a thank you for, to both, because the questions are really very helpful. And actually, I can merge you had actually two questions. Yes, sorry. <laughs> so I can merge your first question with the question of the gentleman on the back, because basically you go down to the same route. First of all, the logic of what I've been writing is the logic uh, that comes from 1951, the European um, Common Defense Treaty that was never concluded because France pulled out at the, at the last minute. That treaty, which I examine thoroughly, explains that the European common defense will become the European leg of NATO. Mm -hmm. So nowhere I claim or anybody in Europe claims that we should replace one with the other. This is not the content, this is not the starting point. What we are saying, what I am saying, what we are advocating on the basis of the treaties so it's not a theory. It's something that has been ratified by parliaments, uh, members of parliament, citizens. I mean, there have been a uh, referendum on this. Mm. So this is not Lucio speaking here. I am simply you know, reflecting what for several times the peoples and the governments of Europe have decided they should do. If that is what we should do, this means that we can offer <coughs> a protection in Ukraine through the European system of defense without formally making Ukraine part of NATO. That would be, that is the logic I'm developing. Now, the question on the back adds the other element. Yeah, also, yeah, but we are, we are here confronted to an untrustable partner. The only thing that he and really understands is, you know, the gun on the table. I have two answers to this. The first one is this exchange should not be theoretical, of course, but it is about the strategy, it's not about the tactics. And so talking about this strategy basing ourselves on a 70 years old uh, leader of the regime, is a dangerous game because it conflates that person with a people and a country that has, that has a very long history. We should not make the mistake of underestimating Russia. Russia is a big country with a long tradition, extremely uh, high intelligent level of uh, hierarchical situation. They have super bright people there. So we have to give them the respect, not because of they do what they are doing, which is terrible, but because they are what they are. 
if I give them that respect, I have to think that Russia can produce a way of governing that is less untrustful than it is today. And we have to build upon that logic, because if the logic is I don't trust to in any event, well, the game is over. We don't even speak to them. We only shoot at them or they shoot at us. The second uh, question that I will, the second answer to your question is uh, Ukraine's borders are very difficult to defend. Georgia's borders are impossible to defend from it. I am not saying because I am a military person, I read. The Battle of Kursk in the Second World War took place in the borders that are actually between Russia and Ukraine, just north of that. It's a plain. So the logic of having our relationship based only and exclusively on military confrontation requires a significant investment of millions of men and an endless number of material and tanks and bombs and drones and whatever. So I don't want to make a ping pong and, and it is a very interesting question you have asking, but my question is in return, are our public opinions likely to accept to spend so much money and to see the sons and the daughters being drafted to the borders to defend that? Because my fear, my own fear, is that if the logic of confrontation is the only one in town, this is what we are going to end up. So my concluding, the answer is a complicated one, but the questions were very complicated. My answer is we need both. We need investment in defense and we need talking to them, trust building, the logic of Helsinki. We have to wrap up for yeah. very precise reasons that I have to go and teach. Um, but this was wonderful. It was a it was a good presentation, wonderful discussion. I mean, really emphasizing some of the key issues that are there. Not least that we have to start thinking long term about many of the concerns that are there, in order not to repeat the same mistakes that we made the last time around when there were there were opportunities for some kind of peace settlement. We don't know what kind of framework uh, there will be for a, for a peace settlement, if any, uh, on this occasion. But it's certainly something that is worth thinking about, including the longer term role of Russia. So I, I agree with what, what Lucio said about the impossibility of a full integration in the European context of, of, of the Russian Federation and the shape that it has now. But what we must not do is to close off uh, any kind of opportunity after Russia has withdrawn from Ukraine, after it has reached a settlement with its neighbors, um, that this uh, much closer relationship with Europe and with the European Union structures would be something that could be achievable, not immediately, but over, over time. I think one of the biggest mistakes that we made in the 90s was to be seen as shutting that kind of link off forever. Uh, which I don't think really was the EU intention, but there were so many other problems and so many other issues to deal with. There was the American intention, uh, uh, intention at the time. But it is a set of issues that we need to look at now because they will come up at the point when, when we have to make decisions about it under circumstances that probably wouldn't give us as much time as we would like to see to make those choices. So thank you, Lucio. This has thank been absolutely wonderful. Thank you to the audience for... Thank you. <laughs>